From Broadcasters General Store Headquarters in Ocala, Florida, it's the BGS Tech Show. Hosted by the BGS sales reps, we'll be featuring new products and ideas from broadcast devices, Sprite Media, Yellow Tech, Omnia, and American Recorder. And now, here's Buck Waters. Hey everybody. Welcome to the BGS Tech Show. Uh, sorry we're, uh, we didn't get to see you guys out in Las Vegas this past April uh, due to the coronavirus. We really missed seeing all of our customers and vendors out there because sometimes this is the only time of the year we get to see you. So we're going to give you a virtual tour of some of the vendors uh, that would have been in our booth and some of the equipment that they would have shown that's new. Uh, and to mention some of the vendors would be uh, Broadcast Devices, Sprite Media, American Recorder, and Yellow Tech to start with. Hi, this is Jessica Shoot with Broadcasters General Store. And since we weren't able to make our annual pilgrimage to Las Vegas this year, we've decided to do things a little bit differently. I'd like to show you one of the really cool products that we would have had in our booth. It's a transmitter remote control made by Bob Tarcio from Broadcast Devices. It's called the SWP300. Well, thanks. First, I'd like to thank uh, all of you at Broadcasters General Store for not only graciously hosting uh, BDI in the NAB booth for, for many years, but also for uh, producing this uh, virtual tour of the NAB booth uh, for 2020, since we couldn't get together with all of you in person this year, and we're disappointed about that, but uh, we thought we'd do the next best thing and bring you a virtual tour of the products that uh, Broadcasters General Store was planning to show at uh, NAB this year, and that includes the BDI product line. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the SWP300 remote control application software that we developed for Windows. And we're looking at the main screen. And uh, before we get into this, I just want to show you one thing that you need to do to get into this main screen. And then this is an initial connect. So you go in here and you put your IP address information in, the other pertinent information in this column. That's done once. You press connect and up will come up the unit information which has some pertinent information like the unit name. If you've given it one, you can give it call letters or a site name. The firmware revisions and the serial number, of course, this one's saying zero because this is a pre-production model used for demonstration purposes here at the, uh, at the shop. All right, so let's go into control. We're gonna go through a very cursory view of this and there's a much better in-depth uh, video on YouTube on our YouTube site. So we invite you to go there and take a look at that for a uh, Real good description of each of the tabs the setup and operation of this But I'm just going to kind of cover this briefly because we don't have a lot of time for this uh, demonstration So let's get to it. This is the uh, the RF page or our summary page and on it is the facility to monitor two of the BDI DPS 100D power meters over here and they're placed in the system as shown here on the switch configuration chart. One is for showing uh, the uh, power that's being delivered to either of the antennas and the other one is for the test load. And then of course we added the SWP macros which are standard in every SWP 200 and 300 product that we build and uh, if you are a uh, customer and owner of an SWP 200 you're probably familiar with these. This is where we automate the functionality of the switches and um, manage the interlocks and, uh, and, and transmit a restart and that kind of thing. That's all done for you. That's not a macro you have to write. So we've done that for the, the switch configurations. Uh, we have a couple of other things here, the um, transmitter status. If you have an external status input from the transmitter to show that they're on, they're both lit here because we have them forced on to show you what they look like when they're lit up. You can put the unit in auto manual and then there's a fault reset. Now over here we have some presets that um, you can program yourself. So these are kind of like macros. You can go in and you can set up um, different things to happen and label the button. These are probably the most commonly used things perhaps or where you have uh, multiple relays or general purpose inputs or switch management that you want to perform all at one time. That can be programmed into these buttons. Briefly show you that in the setup here in just a moment. The second half of the screen is really a cursory view of all the GPIO of the unit and the relay outputs. So we're monitoring up to 12 analog inputs with this unit. Uh, there are four in the SWP300 chassis and then if you have the IOX24 extender panel, uh, it gives you an additional 
uh, uh, well, we'll give you an additional eight, so you'd have a total of 12. And you can see one of them is actually showing that there's an alarm condition. And we'll go take a look at that in a minute. It's showing that there's something, uh, the tr transmitter one power is, uh, looks like it's over a limit. So we can go check that out over here, and we can see that uh, it's 8.47 kilowatts. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, that we're, that's kilovolts, and we're actually looking at the wrong one. It's the analog input number three, so it's showing 108.8%, so that needs attention. Um, so the operator can take a look at this and say, oh, i got to go take a look at this. Instead of having to pour through a lot of screens, they can see what's going on right away and then just go zero in on it like so. Um, so you can do that with any of the, um, these indicators. These are the GP uh, outputs. They're all showing that uh, they're in the off state. Uh, these can be set for momentary or, or maintained. We'll show you that in just a bit. Um, the GPIs, same thing. We have on-off conditions. And uh, you can go and take a look at the GPI inputs and see what they actually are and which ones are on or off. And uh, there's the GPOs, just to show you that. That's control of the GPOs. They're all set for momentary at the moment. Relays. Um, and the various things that you, you can put in here, you can name them and you can set them up for latched or momentary closure, which we'll show you in the I.O. setup. What this is indicating is that this was, um, this action was performed recently. This is a momentary. And if you go back to the RF page, you can see that it's showing, hey, relay one number one was exercised recently here. So um, I can go and I can clear that. I'm not going to do any harm here because um, this is a momentary closure uh, for turning the transmitter on. If I simply do that, it is uh, simply going to clear the display. And I can go back here and you can show that it's off now or it's, the, the display is cleared. Now, of course, you can set these up for a latched input and then you want to be careful about doing on or off. But uh, this is just an extra indicator for you. So that's basically the control of the unit. Um, you have the summary page. You can check your analog inputs. You can look at your GPIs. You can control your GPOs and your relays all with the touch of a, a, a mouse click. So just briefly showing you the I.O. setup, this is how you go in and you set the unit up. Analog inputs, you can select a channel, put your min and max uh, sample voltages in and the display indications that you want with the, um, the units that you want to display. Set your faults up. And then actually, we hand, we, I got to show you this. We have a handy test gauge that we developed for the product. And so you put in... The actual, this is the actual DC voltage that is being applied to the A to D converter of the input of the unit. So that's the DC uh, plate voltage sample here, PAV sample, uh, that's being read. And you'd put that in here, hit set, and then you can take, take a look at your indication and see if that makes sense based upon what you've put in here. So you can, you can trim this as, uh, as you need to, and uh, when you're all done, you just quit the test mode and you should be in good shape. So it takes the drudgery out of setting up analog inputs. General purpose inputs, here you can name them and you can set them as to whether they're invert input or not. So what this means is in the default condition, um, the a low going in will light the light and uh, if you want to set it for a high to light the light, you just do that. And you can do that on a channel by channel basis. Okay, and then on the general purpose outputs, once again, you can name them and um, you can uh, uh, set them as to whether they're momentary or, or latch. Of course, momentary is the default, but you can set them for latch by doing that. Uh, let me just show you what happens when you do that. I can go back to the control screen here, go back to RF page, and you see they're all off. But now if I go to a GP out and I do that, and you notice that this changed from a what looks like a pulse to a solid bar. So now if I go back in to the RF page here, the summary page, you'll see that that one's on. Okay, and that's kind of how that works. So there's the setup. Um, there are a few other things to look at. You have um, a logging function, and um, we're, we're looking at, uh, well, right now we're looking at the room temperature, and that's a, uh, uh, a graph of the room temperature. It looks like it's been pretty stable. And uh, you can do that in graphical form, and you can do it in a list form, and it shows you what the temperature is. Of course, these are point numbers, but you can put a time and date stamp in here as well. Of course, you can give all of this a file name and copy it and copy it to the machine that you're running the app on, but the unit itself at the site is also storing this information and sending this information out periodically as you set up. 
And uh, let's see what else have we got left to show you here. Um, in the on the automate page, this is how you set up those um, those uh, macros that we were talking about or the presets. You can pick a button, and you can give it a name, and you can go in and you can set up. Uh, well, you can go in and set up relays. Right on this one, we have it looks like we have uh, one, three, five, and seven turning on at the same time. And so that one button for button number one, which is uh, auxiliary antenna ops, will close those relays at the same time. And they'll all be momentary closures because you set that up over on the, uh, on the relay uh, setup page. And that's all you do. So um, setting this unit up takes a very, very short amount of time. We made it as easy as possible. No complicated software to uh, have to learn and uh, memorize anything. It's all done for you very, uh, very simply with these tabs. And that's the whole app. So we hope you take a look at the SWP 300. We think it's an important product. Some other things that we really got to we've got to mention here. First of all, everything that's going on here is operating via SNMP. All SWP 300s, all SWP 200s, our power meters, the DPS 100D series, and even our audio toolbox series like the ATB 300 and the GPM 300 are all SNMP agent devices, which means there are MIBs published for each product which also means that not only can you use BDI's uh, graphical user interface to operate and control and monitor your product, but you can use third-party software that's SNMP compatible and third-party remote control systems that are SNMP compatible. So even if the SWP 300 um, doesn't look right for your operation, maybe you need more um, of something that uh, a more expensive remote control uh, system might provide, the SWP 300 can still act as a uh, peripheral device for that larger system, a subsystem of the larger system, to doing things like switch control and monitoring power and doing all this other GPIO stuff and control stuff. So you have a remote control within a remote control in that scenario. But this product's really been designed and targeted for the um, budget conscious broadcaster. It's a medium priced uh, product. It's um, you know somewhere in the middle of all the remote control products. Uh, the SWP 300-2T, the list price is $3,195, $3,195, and the 1T is $2,995. So it is, uh, it's really a, uh, a feature-packed unit for, uh, for the price point. So we think um, this is something that's been needed in the marketplace, and uh, we, that's why we wanted to bring it to you. So for more information about applications and configuration for your operations, certainly contact us here at Broadcast Devices. Uh, and for pricing information and delivery, we want you to give the folks at Broadcasters General Store a call and they can take care of you. So hopefully you've uh, enjoyed this uh, brief introduction to the SWP 300 series remote control from BDI. And thanks for watching. Have you heard of digital signage? Jeff Schick from Sprite Media will tell us more about how digital signage fits into the broadcast environment. Tell us about it, Jeff. Thanks, Buck. Since this is a virtual trade show, uh, I'm obligated to uh, offer you some uh, candy. Take one, uh, just just one. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, can I scan your badge? Thank you. And uh, you're gonna get my last business card, okay? So don't lose it. I'm Jeff Schick from Sprite Media, and welcome to lovely Queens, New York. Today I'm going to be speaking about digital signage. You see them everywhere, from banks to malls to fast food restaurants, but how can digital signage fit in your facility, and more importantly, how can you make money with it? There's numerous uses for digital signage in the broadcast environment, from super accurate clocks to getting information to your DJs, to getting company information to your staff. Uh, plus, don't forget branding and remote possibilities, and of course, new income streams. How about having your DJ studio, newsroom, sports booth sponsored by a local merchant? In this case, we have the Main Street Bank uh, sponsoring the studio on this Sprite Media stretch clock. Are you streaming to the web or posting videos online? Tear down those old plastic banners and replace them with new graphics on a video display. During the coronavirus quarantine, you've probably seen some reporters doing stories from home with video screens behind them. Why not use this look? You might even look better than your local TV channels. So how does this work? First you start off with the Sprite Media Media Player. 
This is a high-end graphics computer. It's not an Arduino. It's not a Raspberry Pi. This device is meant to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years and years. It also has much higher quality graphics than you'll find on any type of project computer. When your Sprite Media media player arrives, you'll need to connect the HDMI cable to the device and to the television. You'll also need to connect an Ethernet cable to your local LAN. This will keep scammers out as it'll only work locally in your facility. And of course, you'll need to plug in the power, the power cable. One of the differences of Sprite Media is we'll configure this all for you. So when you take it out of the box, it's ready to go. Also, we don't charge any fees or licensing additional. Once you pay for it, you own it. We can even set your Sprite Media Player up to work without the internet, so you can use it as a trade show or a remote broadcast where internet is not possible. Once your Sprite Media Player is powered up, you'll see the IP address on the screen. Put this IP address in the browser of your computer, tablet, or smartphone, and the Sprite Media command page will appear. You can quickly and easily make changes on the fly. We make this as easy as possible to use with no programming knowledge necessary. This is our new product called the Podcaster. We'll be talking about this later in the program. And then you have clocks. Sprite Media offers several stretch clocks, and we'll be talking about this later in the show and how you can sync it with an NTP internet signal. How about providing clocks to local businesses with your logo and information? Don't forget branding, both in-house and on remotes. If you don't see the display you're looking for, give us a call or email us. We can custom make almost anything you can think of. All Sprite Media display products are available from the Broadcast General Store right now. Hi, I'm Travis Tibbet from Broadcasters General Store. Have you seen the Intellimix Mixer with G-Touch? Jeff Williams from Yellow Tech will tell you all about it. I'm Jeff Williams. I represent Yellow Tech USA. Yellow Tech itself is a German company, but I'm the U.S. representative for the fine products from Yellow Tech. Here at the show, I'm going to be discussing the Intellimix 2. In Europe, Yellow Tech has been known for making a small analog-based console, but now they've updated to Intellimix 2 to where it's a digital console that's not only four faders, but it's also eight faders as they're layered. But there's a little bit of a sex appeal to this console as it has touch faders with it and you're able to change inputs and outputs on a fly. Now with our control unit, it also has multiple analog AES digitals, but also we support Dante and soon we'll be supporting AES 67, Ravenna, and along with Livewire Plus for the broadcast world. The console is designed primarily for the US market as a small production room, voiceover booth, video production booth, audio mixer for uh, monitoring and also doing voiceover work. So check us out at www.yellowtech.com. Hi folks, this is Gary Tibbet from Broadcaster General Store. If you're in the market for a new or replacement RF power monitoring system, I'd like to introduce you to Bob Tarsio from Broadcast Devices. Bob's got an exciting product called the DPS100D. It's a digital RF power monitoring system. I think you're going to be excited to see the details and the specs on this product. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. We'd like to tell you what we've been doing to make improvements to the very popular DPS100D series power meters from BDI. This is the Generation 2 DPS100D. I happen to have one right here in my hand. This is the DPS100D-N. It is an N-style connector in and out. Uh, many folks don't realize we make one this small, but we do. Uh, this particular meter is uh, 200 watts full scale, but we can make these up to a kilowatt full scale. And the other significant change in this particular meter is that this is a broadband meter, 80 to 1,000 megahertz. And you'll notice no slugs, nothing to change. It's all done in software. And the software is the big story, and that's what we want to show you. We've upgraded the firmware to run the meter. We've added some significant improvements to the operation of the meter. And most importantly, we've eliminated the requirement to use Adobe Flash to run the product. This is a completely flash-free product. It's a Windows app. There is a basic browser uh, introduction that you need to do for setup, but it's HTML5, very simple to do. 
So we're going to get into all that right now. All right, here's the brand new DPS 100D Generation 2 software that we've developed, firmware application and software that we developed for Windows. And um, this is the main screen, and you'll notice a similarity between this and uh, the previous video that we showed you of the SWP300 remote control system, that it has a similar look. It does. It has the same look and feel, so we've tried to streamline our product, so if you learn one, the others are very easy to, uh, to navigate. So just real quickly, we're going to run through this product. Again, there's a more in-depth video on our YouTube channel for the DPS100D Generation 2 meter that uh, will give you a real run through the meter, but we just want to very quickly go through some of the, uh, the new features and uh, some of the screens and show you how, to, how the meter is set up and operated. So this is the main screen. The um, most significant difference you'll see right away is that we've added the frequency so that the actual frequency that the meter is calibrated for is displayed on the front uh, of the unit and right on the, on the meter page. It's right there. And uh, another significant uh, change that we've made is that uh, all DPS 100D power meters are now frequency agile in the field. You do not have to send the meter back for recalibration. If it's on an FM frequency, you can put it on any other FM frequency. And it's fully calibrated, automatically calibrated in the field. Same thing for television. So we've, uh, we've done that. Another significant uh, addition, speaking of uh, radio and television, FM and television, we've also now added support for all digital AM. So we have a medium wave meter that operates actually not only in, uh, for the AM band, but also the entire HF spectrum. So if you have an HF application or an all digital medium wave application for AM radio, uh, the DPS100D can now uh, be used for measuring accurate power for digital AM. Okay, so moving right along here, because I don't have a lot of time, um, of course, the forward and reflective power indications uh, familiar to everyone who has a DPS-100D or a power meter for that matter. We've also added simultaneous uh, indication of VSWR. Previously, you had to pick one or the other of reflective power or VSWR. Now we give you all three simultaneously. Still have internal temperature and the external temperature plug-in, the TMP-100 that's available from BDI, and our uh, pressure uh, indication from our PSW100 pressure sensor indicator, which, uh, which is also available from, uh, from BDI. And then the lower half of the, of the page are the various set points for alarm conditions, and some are showing that they are an alarm. Uh, those are something you can set up yourself. Um, the status of the general purpose inputs, of course, there are five available to the user, and the sixth one is our external interlock input, which is what we call LODO, or a lockout tagout. And then we have a control uh, panel for a single transmitter. Very often um, our customers use the BDI uh, DPS100D power meter as a remote control for a very simple site like a translator or a single transmitter site. So you have uh, positive control of the transmitter uh, when you configure one of the relays to do that, uh, which is done in the setup. And then of course the three strike counter, which uh, is our uh, proprietary uh, trademarked three-strike VSWR protection system that uh, keeps track of the number of VSWR hits you have and when you get up to three it'll open your interlocks and protect your transmission system from damage and of course there is a reset there which is shown it's shown grayed out here. Uh, so let's uh, move right, right along here. Oh you know what I wanted to show you the connect screen very much like the, the uh, SWP300 put your information in over here hit connect and it brings up all the information about the unit. What's new is we've also added the serial number for the directional coupler that is mated to your power meter. So that's there uh, electronically available before you had to go read it off of the directional coupler itself. So that's uh, another improvement that we, uh, that we added. Um, the events tab is very much the same. We have um, an event log keeping track of all uh, alarm conditions and um, it keeps track of a number of events. You can scroll through them and then you can purge them. And this also can send out an email log of these if you have that set up. And speaking of setup, let's go into the setup menu really quickly and just go through all of these. You notice again the setup is very similar to the SWP300. We have some tabs in here that allow you to set up your door name, your like, door name. Well, that's what we call the first one, door ajar. I guess we set that for uh, the inputs. The general purpose inputs can be given names here, and then you can um, set up your alarm. Uh, conditions for what you want to be warned about or to uh, create a fault condition 
and some of these are check mark as you can see VSWR fault a warning um, and so on and so forth um, the display actually is the display settings of the unit itself every DPS 100D power meter has an LCD display on it for convenience and so you can set the uh, display up uh, for either VSWR indication return loss or row and um, power indication watts or kilowatts or dBm and the temperature indication is Celsius or Fahrenheit. Uh, emailing is pretty straightforward. Set up your uh, server information, put your users in, and uh, how often you want them to get emails or logging. You can turn the logging on or off here and set that up. So let's set it up for a daily log. And um, network setup is for the network time protocol. That's defaulted to on. If you have access to a, a time protocol server, it's going to sync up to that. And if you don't, you can deselect that and put the time and date in manually and hit set, and that'll set the time and date for you. And of course, you can keep track of your time zone. The remote tab, very simply, your interlock groups that are tied to the general purpose inputs, you can use the other the, the five general purpose inputs that are available to you for simple indications, or you can make them part of an interlock group. So we can set that up, and then you can enable them as, uh, as needed. We still support the uh, legacy remote control systems that have uh, metering inputs. We do support uh, DC outputs for forward reflected power, and this is the scaling for that. This is how you set up your two uh, relays, interlock or alarm, transmitter on, alarm, transmitter on, off, uh, and RF presence. Uh, RF presence is lets, you, um, lets you have a relay that closes anytime RF is present, um, and that's pretty handy for RF safety. You can light a light with that or have it sound a, uh, a sound alert or something like that. Uh, you now have the ability to trigger BSWR events to open the interlock and keep track of the three strike. Before it was only reflected power, now it's either. And uh, again, you can set that up over here. You set your trip points up in the RF setup page. Of course, you can also have them for reflected uh, power and you can switch b b between the two. If you like to keep track of the reflected power to have that do your trip, you can do that or you can use BSWR. So these are some of the improvements that we made to the product. This is a really quick overview. I know I speak very fast. Well, after all, I'm from New York and we do everything quickly here. So <laughs> that's just the way it is. But um, again, we just want to remind everybody this is an SNMP agent device. So it's compatible with all modern SNMP based remote control systems and third party software in addition to the BDI application software. Uh, new uh, is the, the fact that we can, we can handle digital AM now, so call us about that. Uh, we're very excited about that as well. So there's a lot of new things happening with the DPS 100D uh, True RMS power line available from BDI. Call us for applications information and call Broadcasters General Store for your price and delivery of any of the BDI products that are being displayed here today. Thanks for watching and uh, we've got uh, one more video for you, so stay tuned. Do you struggle with managing your wiring and keeping it neat and in order? Alan Edelstein with American Recorders might just have a great solution for you. Check out the snake skin. Alan here from the American Recorder Technologies Tech Center. And today I'm going to talk to you about snake skin cable cover and regrip cable straps and how it can make your job easier when doing cable dressing out there in the field. Snakeskin is a unique cable cover. It is self-wrapping and it has a memory. And once you wrap it around the wires, the snakeskin will close around itself, making a very neat and manageable loom. And snakeskin comes in retail packs of eight feet or you can get it in bulk packages of 25, 50, or 100. Snakeskin and regrip cable straps can really save you time and money while you're on the job. So normally uh, when we're looming a audio rack like this we would use the, the nylon ties and nylon ties have been the standard for many years and as you know as many of you probably have used them you have to take them and it would go up and down the rack like that installing one right after another. Well two things about this. One, it's very time consuming. And the second thing is that it creates a lot of waste because you cut away at, you don't actually use most of the um, 
nylon tie. So here's an audio rack that we put together and uh, just kind of like the basics, real light, nothing too heavy, but you kind of get the general idea. We have some audio equipment, we have some IT telecom, we have some closed circuit TV, maybe connected to an NVR, and it might be a retail store, could be a restaurant. So this is just one type of system. And uh, we have our wires color coded. Uh, we have our, our audio wires are black and our IT telecom are blue and our CCTV is yellow. So what I like to do is I like to take my snake skin and I like to group it with each category. So there's my audio cable, my IT and telecom wires, and here's my CCTV wires. And now I have all the cable wrapped, and now I'm gonna use my re-grip cable straps instead of nylon ties. Now, if I have a problem later on, instead of having to take my cutters and cut each one of those nylon ties apart, all I have to do is take my regrip right off. And let's just say if I have a bad cable on my camera, I can just pull off my snake skin, change the cable, and then I can put it back on here again because it's totally reusable. Snake skin is available in a variety of diameters and colors, from half inch to inch and a half, and in black and white. Regrip cable straps are available from three inches for just covering a couple of wires to all the way to 16 inches by two inch wide for big massive looms. Just that easy, just that quick. Use snake skin, use regrip, save yourself time, save yourself money, and you'll have a much better looking cable management uh, rack or wherever you're running your cables. Thanks, and uh, check out our website, www.americanrecorder.com to see all the various different snakeskin and regrip cable management product. Thanks. Since 1979, Broadcasters General Store has been a leading source of broadcast equipment and services. Whether it's a complete studio rebuild or a handful of connectors, BGS takes care of everything. Family owned since its inception, the business is now being run by the second generation of the Shute and Kirsten family. We know how to get things done by coordinating the ordering from over 600 manufacturers' products and arranging delivery and staging of projects through reputable installers to deliver complete systems. To all our customers, we appreciate your patronage. We will seek to give you solutions that are cost-effective, innovative, and reliable. Contact us today at 352-622-7700 or www.bgs.cc. Hi there, this is Brittany from Broadcasters General Store. Do you podcast or post to social media? Sprite Media has a new product for you. Here's Jeff Schick to explain. We just introduced this new product, the Sprite Podcaster, at the PodFest show in Orlando. You've probably seen local newscasters doing reports with TV screens behind them. You can have this look for your podcasts, and it'll probably even look better than your local news. The Sprite Podcaster offers several different styles, or if you need one specific, we can always add that in for you. Our screens are easy to use and easy to operate. Put the IP address in computer, tablet, or smartphone, and the Sprite command page will appear. I'll show you several of the designs that are built into this one. We added several potential sponsors to this screen so we can show you how you can make money with it. On the top you can see Snapchips is presenting it. Um, that's my fictitious favorite chip, by the way. And we also have logos for Broadcasters General Store and Sprite Media with our flashing on-air sign. Here are some of the built-in choices. High visibility, brick wall, chalkboard, scoreboard, marquee, spinning globe, moving triangles, blue wave, red wave. Changes take place immediately. 
we put the presentation together for you on your Sprite Media Player. Plug it in and it's ready to go. To learn more about the offerings of Sprite Media, go to www.sprite-media.com. The Sprite Podcaster is available right now from the Broadcasters General Store. Hi, this is Jonathan Shute from Broadcasters General Store. The TELUS Alliance loaded all their gear for NAB 2020 into their van. Here's Paul Kriegler from the TELUS Alliance to give you the tour. Hey! It's Paul Kriegler. I'm the U.S. Director of Sales for the TELUS Alliance for radio processing sales, which means Omnia. So uh, I travel country using this wonderful van that the company's given us with the latest in uh, Axia and Telos and Omnia gear and you'll get to see it here in a minute but I get to drive this van around the country and do demos uh, for our customers and had this van right before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So the good news is I got to bring a whole lot of work home which we like about right now. Talking to one of my friends, he says, you know, if you're going to do a demo as if you're at the NAB, and this, this the whole idea of this piece is to do a demo as if we were standing at the NAB to show you what the Omnia rack would have looked like uh, at this year's NAB, which obviously isn't happening this year. Um, and he said, well, you know, a friend of mine said, you've got to get dressed up and pretend like you're at, at the NAB, which means, you know, suit and tie and name tag. So got myself all dressed up for this special occasion, put on the tie, put on the suit. We even got the old TELUS Alliance name tag. So uh, let's give you a quick look around the van and see what you got here. If you've never seen the van, I drive the van around the country. Right? If we haven't met, hopefully in the next year, year and a half, we'll get a chance to meet. Um, so, what, like you're wearing pants when you're on all these Zoom calls? Come on, let's take a look. You like the flip flops? You, see, you, like, you like the flip flops? All right, so we got a big old generator in this van to run everything that we got in here. In the back of the van, this is where the magic smoke is. Shh, we don't let the magic smoke out, ever. My favorite part of this van is, let's say you've got a radio station and you wanted to uh, bring this van up next to your transmitter site and run one of our audio processors through your air chain. We could do that. We've got live wire connectivity here. We've got BNC connectors to hook up the composite outputs of our audio processors. We've got speaker outputs, the whole thing here. Plus, we've got shore power. So if you want to run it on shore power for an extended period of time, you could do that. Uh, external power here. But uh, the magic is actually up here inside. So this is my absolute favorite toy to take on the road and do audio processing demos, as you might imagine, as a nerd, as a self-professed techie and radio geek this is this is my playground a couple computers here to run the remote control software we've got the omni 11 remote control running on the right hand computer here playout pc2 playout pc one's running the windows media player interface i'm just i'm just playing wave files but of uh somewhere around here i've got a copy of zeta that i could play out in the van and, and automate things power station main control here we're uh, running the fusion up above you can see the fusions monitor here for the metering Pathfinder Core Pro to help run things in the VX Prime system. With this phone up here on the left hand side, don't know if you can see that, it's kind of dark. And you see the phone? I can place a phone call from there to there. Fusion has the call controller built into it. IQ console here on the left, core is down below. And this is the rack at the back of the van. Now, if this was the rack at NEB 2020 and I was here doing the demo, I'm gonna go top to bottom. What was the top item in the rack? down to what would have been the very bottom item in the rack and the very top rack just above eye level would have been the TVC15. So if you take a close look up here at the TVC15, you're gonna see a number there at the top it says that if, uh, if this unit was controlling a Voltaire on the same network, based on how much watermark this TVC15 is seeing, it would change your watermark enhancement to this level in the Voltaire because not all audio was really created equal in Nielsen's eCBAT encoding world, and the TVC15 lets you see your watermark in real time. So a couple of my favorite features here in the van are one, down here at transmitter, and then over here in the second rack, we got this composite switch, and this way I can switch between all the processors in the rack, 
really get a better feel for all the processing firepower here in the van. Next up in the rack at NEB would have been up here the Omnia 11. So last year we had a new free software update 3.6.22 and made some improvements to the final clipper. Some things that I love about the Omni 11, it sounds superior on FM and HD. The census codec in the HD section makes it sound phenomenal. The 11 overall, it's kind of famous for having a big open um, huge sound and the new clipper helps even more so. There's an optional de clipper in the Omni 11. The uh, stereo enhancement in the 11 is some of the best I've ever heard. Um, and you know, the blue interface, it's it's very calming. Next on the rack would have been the Omni 9. We've got uh, new software updates, which improves the clipper and adds support for the micro MPX codec, which means, yes, your Omni 9 could be part of an STL end-to-end -end system for your radio station. What I like about the 9, it's got a very clean sound, uh, an adjustable number of bands. So if you wanted it to be a 3 or a 4 band for a talk station or a 7 band for a top 40 format, it can do that. It's incredibly flexible. It can do FM, HD1, HD2, HD3, streaming, dynamic RDS, all at the same time. It slices and dices. And uh, it can even be an encoder to drive an MPX node at your transmitter, like I said earlier. So uh, on the back, lots of I.O. and all new units since 2018 have come with live wire support standard. So uh, the sky is the limit here as far as the amount of inputs and outputs you want to put into the Omnia 9. And then you've got the NF remote interface, which is it's a much better way to, to navigate the unit and make presets for it using the back end. Declipper and Undo are also included on every Omnia 9. Now, the Volt, the big announcement for uh, NAB 2020 would have been Volt 2.0, which is here with a uh, bunch of brand new starting preset points for various formats. whole bunch of them are in their country. Uh, top 40, there's a Top 40 Bright preset, Hot AC, Urban, um, more AM presets have been added to the AM version, and uh, there's also SNMP support. What I like about this new version of the Volt, I like a lot of the new presets. It should make your experience with the Volt a lot uh, simpler off the get-go with the new format starting uh, points. And I think it sounds cleaner. You know, you're always a 10-minute free update away with the Volt from going from, say, an FM version to an AM version. And let's say you need uh, a, a quick processor for headphone feeds, for uh, like jock feeds. The HD version is great for that. And then for the Volt, you've got this HTML5 interface, which makes getting into the deeper adjustments on the Volt uh, a lot easier. Over here back in the first rack is the Omnia 9SG. This would have been the next item down below the Volt. Uh, the 9SG takes the final composite generator from the Omnia 9 and sticks it in this one rack unit standalone box. Now, what I love about it, it's an extremely clean, precise stereo generator and composite clipper, too. Uh, you can do dynamic RDS in the Omnia 9 SG, and it's really great for having an Omnia 9 at the studio, let's say, for example, and you've got an HD exporter there, too. Maybe your watermark encoders are there as well. And then you would have a 9 SG at the transmitter site to generate that same composite signal that you would have had out of the 9, and do it out at the transmitter site. And it's also great with other processors in front of it, like an Omnia 11, just saying. The uh, Omnia 7 down below, you can buy these as AM or FM versions, and it's customers seem to understand when I say the Omnia 7 is like an Omnia 9 Junior. What I like about the Omnia 7, it takes a trained ear to tell the difference between an Omnia 9 or an Omnia 7. It really does. Like a 9, uh, you can get RDS options and streaming options and HD options for the Omnia 7. And really, the AM version of the Omnia 7 is the best sounding AM processor ever. I'm just going to say it. So, we have a software audio processor in the Omnia lineup. It's called Omnia SST. And what I like about it, it's a very clean composite generator has the same composite clipper algorithms that you're going to find in the Omnia 9 or the uh, Omnia 9 SG. Could do RDS. Has uh, restoration tools aside from Declipper, which is in Omnia SST, also contains Dehummer and Delossifier, which can help restore some of the artifacts from badly encoded audio. Yes, Delossifier. Uh, requires Windows. Need a sound card to go with this 192 kilohertz sampling rate if you want to generate composite and plug that into an exciter. And, uh, also includes a low latency feed to give announcers in the studio and easier controls to navigate and get the sound you want. So moving on to streaming, we've got software and hardware for streaming. And first up, I'm going to show you the software for streaming that we sell here at TELUS Alliance. 
uh, which can be put into our hardware boxes. First off, the software features of the X2 software. So this is our entry-level streaming solution for PC. So it can handle multiple mount points. So if you want to send your stream to the different bit rates, uh, different codecs, you can set that up in the software. The Dynex 2, this has all the power of the popular Omni 9 audio processing platform. You can see I'm running NF Remote here to access the software. And uh, what I like about it, of course, well, thousands of buttons. And it uh, takes all the power of the Omni 9 and puts it right there at your fingertips for your stream. And that's huge. Contains the same stereo enhancement, solar plexus base enhancement that you'll find in the 9. It's got the undo section. The clipper is here too. So if you play modern music, it's going to open that up a bit more. And um, just like the Omnia 9, it's brother, fully adjustable number of bands. So maybe you're a talk station, you only want three bands. Or you're a music station, you can have as many as seven. Also does enhanced AAC+. Plus. You get to use NF Remote too, which is the best way to adjust processing for the Omnia 9. So on the hardware side, we've got the Zipstream R1, which is our entry-level streaming audio processor. And as we like to say about the Zipstream R1, if you got a stream, it is basically plug, play, and stream, and won't break the bank either. It's basically the uh, same Omnia 3-band audio processing that we spoke about earlier here in this box. Except it takes analog, AES, or live wire inputs, and uh, just one rack unit, uses an HTML5 interface. So our other hardware unit for streaming here is the R2, and do not let its size fool you. Um, it does go deep in the rack, but uh, it is high-density stream processing. So if you think about it, this single rack unit box would replace a full rack worth of computer servers or sound cards inside a radio station. Uh, you can get into it with live wire or regular AES connectivity and process up to eight different program channels um, with multiple encoders and mount points available. Here on the front of the unit, probably you can see here, uh, I've just got one program channel activated, but it can run either the X2 or the 9X2 software. So you can mix and match and uh, totally maxed out the R2 can run eight separate instances of the 9X2 software. Hey, thanks again for checking out our NAB 2020 video. Uh, if you need any help with Omnia audio processing during this time, you can look me up. Uh, paul.kriegler at telusalliance.com uh, You can also call the front desk in Cleveland 216-241-7225 I look forward to hearing from you and hope to see you soon. Happy trails. Broadcast Devices has just introduced a new subcarrier generator. Bob Tarasio is going to tell us about it. Alright, the next thing we'd like to show you is BDI's brand new model SCA200 dual 67 kilohertz SCA generator. Now I got one right here behind me in the rack and you'll notice the lack of controls on the unit because there are no physical controls on this unit because it's DSP based and SNMP controlled. Each generator has an A and B input which is XLR balanced and two independent outputs that are 50 ohm BNC. So in the next installment here we'll take a look at the setup and show you how easy it is to control and set up the SCA200. Now this is an HTML5 browser interface, so it's free from Adobe Flash, as all of our products are now. And what you basically do is go in and set up the unit name, username, password, SNMP read and write communities, the SNMP port, and of course the IP information, IP address, IP mask, default gateway, and DNS server. And once you've done that, hit the save button and that's in there for good and always good idea to take a screenshot of this anytime you're doing any kind of password saving uh, or changes to IP configurations it's always good to take a screenshot and tuck that away in a safe place all right let's take a look at the SCA 200 Windows application that uh, we created for this product this is an app that you install on a Windows machine. It's compatible with Windows 10 and previous editions of Windows, all, I think going all the way back to XP. Um, first thing you would do is go to the Connect screen and you would enter the IP address and port information, read and write community that you saved in the um, initial HTML5 browser interface connection. And once you've done that, 
click on connect. That will connect with the unit. It'll bring up the unit name that you've saved, firmware revision, and the serial number. Of course, the firmware revision, again, is a good thing to have handy in case you need service. You can tell us what firmware revision it is. So let's click on the control tab. And as we said earlier, this is a dual uh, SCA generator. We have two completely independent SCA generators, so you can set them up independently from one another, channel one and channel two. So let's go through channel one, because channel two setup is exactly the same. We have an input select control. This unit has two inputs, balanced XLR inputs. So you can select between those or an internal tone generator. Now, in addition to being able to do this with the app, or via an SNMP uh, browser or any SNMP software or a third-party remote control system that's uh, SNMP compatible. There's also a hardware GPIO on the rear panel of the unit so that you can select between A and B inputs. Now one example of where you might use this is if you wanted to interface the generator with an EAS generator receiver and you wanted to interrupt the program audio to insert EAS information and you wanted to trigger it from the EAS generator, you'd be able to do that with the GPIO. That's just one example. Next, you have the input level control. That can be adjusted in 1 dB increments or 10th of a dB increments for a fine trim. And you have a plus and minus 10 dB gain range. And again, that's independent. The A and the B input can be set for different levels if necessary. Next item for setup is pre-emphasis. And uh, we can select between 50, 75, 150, 225 microseconds, or you can turn it off. So let's go ahead and select 225 microseconds. The next audio option you have is a filter, a low-pass filter, which you can either have bypassed or you can set for 10 kilohertz or 5 kilohertz. So let's go ahead and set it up for 5 kilohertz. And then the mode control. So this allows you to turn the unit off, turn it on, or put it in the auto mode. And the auto mode is a traditional SCA generator auto mode, whereby if the audio is removed from the input of the unit, that the SCA output will mute after so many seconds. And again, this is another item that can be controlled by the parallel GPIO or any of the other mentioned SNMP interfaces. And then the last thing you need to do is to set up the output level and uh, otherwise known as the injection level that would be fed uh, to adjust uh, for the particular exciter. And so this unit has two independent 50 ohm BNC outputs so they can be adjusted accordingly. And again, plus and minus 10 dB gain range in 1 dB increments and 10 of a dB increments. So once you've done that, the unit's all set up and you can go ahead and uh, operate the SCA generator into your transmitters and that's all you need to do. So if you need an SCA generator to replace an aging one that you might have or contemplating a new service, We'd suggest you contact Broadcasters General Store, ask them for price and delivery on the broadcast devices, SCA 200, dual 67 kilohertz subcarrier generator. And I want to really thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Carly. Have you heard about the stretch clock from Sprite Media? Broadcasters General Store has it available right now for broadcast facilities and businesses. Here's Jeff Schick to tell you more about it. We noticed that broadcast clocks really haven't changed very much in the last 40 years, so we decided to do something about it. We introduced the Sprite stretch clock a few years ago to much excitement, and now we just added a new member to the family of stretch clocks. This one is called the Lobby Stretch Clock. It comes with nine different display types, three multi-city analog, three multi-city digital, and three single clock logos, which are perfect for on-air studios, lobbies, or newsroom. The stretch clock gets its signal from an NTP signal on the internet. NTP stands for Network Time Protocol. We configure the clock media player to run right out of the box. You choose the look of the clock, and you can also change the message or add a sponsor like we did right here with Main Street Bank. The stretch clock comes as a package from the Broadcasters General Store. It includes the media player and the display. The display is 36 inches by 11 inches. It's also 700 nits, which is two and a half times brighter than a normal TV. It's also rated for 24 hour a day, seven day a week usage. 
and also an on-site three-year warranty. Let's take a look at what it does. We have three different styles of analog multi-city clocks. We have three different styles of multi-city digital clocks. And then we have three different styles of single analog and digital clocks. The Sprite Media Lobby Stretch Clock is available from Broadcasters General Store right now. I'd also like to thank Broadcasters General Store for letting us be part of this show today. Thanks, guys. Uh, this is Chris Harple from Broadcasters General Store. Hope everybody is doing well and staying safe. Uh, right now, I'm going to send you out to California to Alan at American Recorder, and he's going to talk to you about a new product he has that will help keep you organized, the Media Box. Hi, Alan here. Welcome back to the American Recorder Technologies Tech Lab. And today I want to talk to you about our media boxes. What are media boxes? Media boxes are little devices like this here. They're made out of thick PVC plastic and they pop open and lock on the bottom. And they have pill and stick tape that's rated up to over 300 degrees so the heat from the TV will not affect it. You just simply peel the pill and stick away and then you attach it directly to the back of the TV. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to take a media device such as this Apple TV and pop it right in the back. So you can use the small for your Apple TV or your Roku device and then we have a larger box that will able to take a small Genie direct from Direct TV. You can also put a power supply in there too so they're not hanging off of cable ties and falling down from back behind the TV. So it makes for a nice clean installation. They're open at the top so it allows heat to dissipate and you can even put a little IR sensor right onto the plastic if you uh, need to do so. So make your installations quick, easy and clean with American Recorder Technology media box holders. Thanks for watching. Everything you've seen here today is available from Broadcasters General Store. Give us a call, 352-622-7700, or you can email us at sales at bgs.cc, or call or email your favorite salesperson at BGS. Thank you for attending. Broadcasters General Store has served the broadcast and associated industry since 1979. Give them a call at 352-622-7700. Check out their website at www.bgs.cc.